like to welcome everyone to our city council meeting. It's 5 o'clock on Monday, October the 17th, and we'll call this uh, city council meeting to order. Everyone, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Deb. Tyler. Here. Don. Here. Jody. Harley. Here. Brad. Here. Rodney. Here. Thank you. Entertain a motion then to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Harley, second from Don. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler. Yes. Don. Yes. Harley. Yes. Brad. Yes. Rodney. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. <coughs> Across the mayor's desk, I'd like to thank Jacob Shedder, our videographer today. And uh, it's kind of busy end of October. We've got to have some events. This coming Saturday, October the 22nd, is the annual craft show. Um, and all the exhibits this year will be at Algona High School. And that craft show is from 9 till 4. And then a week from Saturday, October the 29th, the Morwins Kiwanis Club has their annual pumpkin decorating, and that will be held at the VFW from 9 to 11, and everyone's invited to that as well. And then Monday, the 31st of October, is trick-or-treat night from 5.30 to 7.30. And the weather certainly looks good for a change this year, so that'll be good. And uh, Julie and I usually have about 200 to 250 little costumes that come to knock on our door. So it's always a fun time. Uh, council, have anything they'd like to share? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to the update from the city administrator. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, the first is I um, want to remind folks of an upcoming public meeting. Uh, the Kasuth County Emergency Medical Services, or Kasuth County EMS, will be hosting an informational meeting on Tuesday, November 1st, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, at the Kasuth County Emergency uh, Response and Training Center. Uh, that's the former... Uh, UBC building there on the uh, intersection of McGregor Street and Highway uh, 169. Uh, Kasuth County EMS Administrator Phil Albers uh, will provide a brief presentation about uh, EMS becoming an essential service um, and then followed by a time for questions on that essential service uh, uh, ballot initiative will be on the November 8th um, general election ballot um, for that levy. So that is Tuesday, November 1st at 6.30. Um, and then as well with the uh, South Park Pickleball Courts, they officially opened for use on Saturday. And I think most of that afternoon they were full. So that was fun to see and heard some really good compliments on uh, the courts. There's still a couple items uh, to be finished up on that project before it's completely ready uh, to be um, accepted by the city. Uh, but we are going to be hosting a uh, formal ribbon cutting on the project uh, this Friday at 10.15 a.m. Uh, following the uh, chamber coffee. So that will be a ribbon cutting at the South Park Pickleball Courts at 10.15 this Friday. Very good. Thank you. Then item number seven, this is the citizen's opportunity to address the council with any item that's not on the agenda. Anyone? President tonight that would like to speak. Seeing none, we'll move to uh, the consent agenda, and that includes approving the minutes from our uh, previous council meeting, October the 3rd, approving the bills that are to, to be paid this cycle, approve the department reports, uh, as well as the minutes from the various boards and commissions that have met, and approve Jacob's administrator's report. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion from Harley, a second from Tyler. Any discussion? Hearing none, vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Well, I'll move to agenda item number nine, which is a public hearing. It's uh, 505, and we will open that public hearing. This is concerning upper story housing grant application. <coughs> um, this is a hearing on the Community Development Block Grant um, Upper Story Housing application. We have uh, Caroline Eggers um, with the uh, North Iowa Area Council of Governments, or NIACOG, here to uh, present some information. Come up to yeah, the podium. Yeah, like come up to the podium there. <coughs> I'm 
Caroline Aganaw, and I am from NIACOG. I am preparing the city's application um, for the CDBG Housing Upper Story Conversion Program on behalf of BD Properties. And I'm here to answer um, any questions that you might have. First part of the hearing is we're going to start with the Community Development and Housing Needs Assessment, as is required since the last one was done over a year ago, and they require that to be done every 12 months if you're submitting an application. And then I'll move on to grant specifics in regards to the CDBG grant. So the community development and housing needs assessment. So community development and housing needs of LMI persons. So the shortage of rent assisted and subsidized housing opportunities, housing in disrepair needs maintenance with some homes blighting neighborhoods, limited opportunity for home ownership for low income and first time buyers, limited amount of rental housing that is accessible for persons with disabilities and never enough free activities slash facilities for youth development. Other community development and housing needs. Um, need housing to improve stock that is in poor condition, especially for those who are aging in place. Um, need infrastructure improvements. Need increased wage levels to match national average. Need continued development of downtown and highway 18 corridor. And then need of increased availability of rental housing. Plan or potential activities to address housing and community needs. Develop uh, rental housing and upper story downtown properties. Encourage and facilitate subdivision and residential construction activity. Continue code enforcement and blight elimination activities. Continue street paving and sanitary and storm sewer upgrade replacement extension. Park and recreational trail development and recreation activities for youth and adults. Encourage economic growth through direct and indirect investment. And then continue downtown and highway 18 corridor revitalization. Um, so if you want to propose any modifications to that list, um, you're more than welcome to just, just shoot them out at me or anything you want to add to that. It's all pretty standard language. <laughs> <laughs> and then next part of this hearing is to more specific towards the actual grant application that um, NICOG is writing on behalf of BD properties that the city will be a, the recipient for. So Team BD is requesting that the city apply for 457,000 um, in federal funding to be applied to a project for the redevelopment of two two-bedroom units at 17 East State Street here in Algona. Um, the grant is known as a CDBG Housing Upper Story Conversion and is competitive under the Housing Conversion Program through the Iowa Economic Development Authority. It is required that a for-profit developer must own the property or have a purchase agreement and convert a previously unused upper story area which needs significant improvements. Also, the upper story must not have been used as rental units in the last five years. So, how the need for activities was identified, the need for creation of new rental housing was identified in previous research and study of Algona's housing climate, such as the comprehensive housing needs analysis for Kasuk County, the downtown assessment as conducted by IDA, and the housing plan created by um, Leclerc Engineering. Other proposed activities will be funded in source of funds. The activities will be funded by a federally funded program called the Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG. The Iowa Economic Development Authority coordinates these funds for the state of Iowa and makes them available to cities through their CDBG Housing Upper Story Conversion Program. The project will also be funded by the developer slash owner, in this case, um, Team BD Properties. Um, the date that CDBG application will be submitted, the application will be submitted on or before November 1st, um, 2022. The requested amount of federal funds is $457,000. Um, the estimated portion of federal funds that will benefit low and moderate income persons, both departments will be rented to households with low to moderate income, so 100% of the funding received will be used to benefit low and moderate income persons at 80% of the area median income. For example, the maximum income for new occupants in a two-person household would currently be 50500 Where the proposed activities will be conducted, the proposed activities will be conducted on the second and third floor of 17th East State Street in Altona. Plans to minimize displacement of persons and businesses resulting of funded activities. The space is currently unoccupied, so no one will be temporarily displaced as a result of this um, program. Plans to assist actually displaced. This space is currently unoccupied, so no persons will be permanently displaced as a result of this program. 
The nature of the proposed activities. The proposed activities will include development of two apartments on the second floor of the downtown Common Wall building located at 17 East State Street in Algona. Um, now, HUD has requirements for citizen participation um, with a specific set of criteria which must be covered in the hearing. So if anyone wants, I don't know, um, if you want to open up to anybody. Now, the, uh, there'll be a resolution where the city will agree to be the grant recipient for the project and approve NIACOG as grant administrator and the community development and housing needs assessment. And that will also authorize the signing of other related documents, such as the federal assurances, which um, basically is the city agrees to comply with pertinent federal laws. And then the applicant disclosure, which is a form that is required by HUD when you apply for financial assistance from their agency. Is all the comments I have. Do you have anything, Jacob? That we have added? not received any comments from the public um, in response to the published notice of the okay. hearing. Very good. Thank, thank you, you Carolyn. Yeah, thank you. It's 5 11, and we will close the public hearing and we will move then to a new business agenda item number 10, and this is a resolution approving uh, this grant application. That public hearing and what was read into the record as well as this resolution probably feel somewhat familiar um, is that what we uh, had to do for our previous applications uh, for the upper story housing program. Uh, so as was uh, referenced in the uh, public hearing, uh, this resolution authorizes uh, the application of the uh, CDBG upper story housing uh, uh, program grant application, approves the community and housing needs assessment, plan and then um, make certain, assur certain assurances um, regarding the application and authorizes the mayor to sign. Motion to approve resolution. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, vote please, Deb. Tyler. Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 11. Uh, this is the second reading um, of an ordinance regulating electric vehicle charging stations on city property. Um, this ordinance um, is adds a new chapter to the city code regarding uh, AMU owned uh, electric uh, vehicle charging stations on city owned property um, regarding parking and use of those. Uh, John Bilstein, um, Algonquin Municipal Utilities General Manager, is here this evening. I'd asked him to attend. Um, since the last meeting, there's a few technical questions that uh, I wasn't able to answer, so I'll hand over to John to provide an overview and answer any questions. All right, great. Thanks, Jacob. I'm John Bilstein. Good to see all of you. I'd like to give you just a brief overview of electric vehicle chargers. There are three types of electric vehicle chargers. There's a level one charger, which would be simple like a triple charger, just plug it into a outlet in your garage, in your home, uh, and charge your vehicle. It takes several hours to charge a vehicle with a, a level one charger. A level two charger is the type of charger that we're installing in the downtown parking lot to the area. Level two chargers can vary in terms of their size. They can be a 7 kW, a 15, up to a 25 kW charger. In the case of what we have purchased, a level two charger with 7 kW would mean that for about one hour charge time that you would uh, get about 25 to 30 miles, depending on your vehicle. Now, there are other variables with electric vehicles that, that could make that different, the weather conditions, if you're running electric heat, things like that. But that's a pretty typical, it's about 25 miles uh, type of charge for one hour. Then the third type of charger is a level three charger. This is typically known as like a DC fast charger. This is the type of charger that you might charge your vehicle up in 20 minutes to a half hour near a full charge, or about a 90% full charge. This is the goal of the Department of Transportation to have along the interstate highway system. We hope eventually along a lot of highway systems and in retail gas station areas where you'll be able to charge quickly as you're making a trek cross country, out of state, wherever that may be. The typical charger I think we'll see will be like a level two charger. This would be common in parking lots like what we're going to install. install be common for any of us that would purchase an electric vehicle in our house. So 
So just a little plug-in, if you're doing electrical work, if you're building a home or something, you might really consider putting a 220-volt outlet in your garage today for an electric vehicle charger like an 11, a level 2. So similar to what you'd put in for an electric uh, clothes dryer, that type of thing. That, that'd be the kind of load that we'd be talking about. But just a proactive thing to do if you have the capacity and if you're building or doing wiring today. <clears throat> that would set you up for the future uh, if you have that. So there are three types of chargers. We're installing a level two charger downtown. It happens to be, the brand is SEMA Connect. There are several brands and they're all on a national charge system, meaning that you'll be able to, app driven, be able to go in and uh, find the charger uh, through a network. Uh, if you're not from around here, you'd be able to find it, find where you can charge pay for it, either through an app or system like that. Your car, many of the cars are smart enough to find the charger for you. But we also have this one set up for credit cards. In the event that somebody doesn't have the app on their phone, they can do it with a credit card or debit card and pay for it that uh, way. So there'll be different ways that you can do it. Uh, we really felt that the downtown area and, and having a lot of discussion with Jacob about this, other staff, we thought uh, this parking lot was a great place to do this, first because it's being rebuilt and secondly, because we, we hope it'll just bring some people down. They'll, they'll be shopping, uh, they'll be going out to eat or something, and they'll come down and plug their charger in. So that's kind of what our plan is. Uh, the Board of Trustees from AMU did set the rates for this level two charger, uh, and those rates are set up at $2 per hour for the first four hours. So each hour, it's $2 uh, per hour. Then after that, uh, after four hours, it'll be $4 per hour with our plan, our hope that that provides an incentive or disincentive to stay plugged in because you should be charged good enough by that point, unplug and move your car off of there. Uh, we know, however, uh, that this may not be enough of an incentive. We hope this would uh, do the trick so that Mo and his team wouldn't necessarily have to get involved, but in some cases they may where people are pulled in there and they're not charging whatsoever, which will be easy to tell because they won't be plugged in. That's, that's really the goal of our program uh, today. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, through a work with Matt, Wes, with Colton and Mink, we've designed additional infrastructure conduit put in place so that as demand increases, if demand, or we believe it probably will in time, we can add additional chargers. So we'll have one pedestal, two chargers today, so two parking stalls, clearly identified with paint, markings, and, and with the chargers. So we hope it'll be easy for people to see which two stalls are, are for electric vehicle chargers. And there may be some additional questions, but I just kind of hit the highlights. Yeah, so you have this set up at $2 for the first four hours, for $2 an hour for the first correct. four hours. That's correct. Yep. Um, how volatile do you think that price is going to be? Is it a good change with electric, electric costs or demand well, costs or? Great question. So just like any rate, uh, if, if our cost increase in time, so we're just going to, part of this is going to be a learning process, uh, Harley, to see how things go, what the impact is. We'll have this metered, so we'll be able to see uh, what its impact is. But that's a pretty standard, what we're seeing across the United States. Uh, th that rate, it, it can vary, but that's, in the Midwest, we're seeing that as a pretty common rate, and it actually matches our cost. Really yeah. Closely. Well, it, it does work. I mean, when you look at 25 to 30, uh, miles per hour um, and you take a, a gallon of gas, a lot of cars get 20 to 30 miles uh, per gallon. So you can compare that cost straight over to the cost per gallon, which is about half for the first four hours there. So it makes sense for the people that have those cars. Yeah, it, it really does. And, and obviously our concern is what will that do in terms of infrastructure as we look at electric vehicle chargers in general, uh, one of the big questions that, uh, that we have a lot of interest in is what happens if everybody in a neighborhood has one electric vehicle charger? Maybe two. Uh, then what does that do to our infrastructure needs, to the size of a transformer? How do we incentivize people to charge at night? Uh, there's just a lot of questions that, uh, that are still unknown. And <coughs> excuse me, we like, unlike, uh, or most like all other electric utilities are having these discussions and trying to figure out uh, what do we do and how
how do we stay on top of all of this? We, we were actually just at a kickoff meeting this afternoon with Iowa State University. Uh, they were able to get a grant through the Iowa Energy Center to take a look at the impact of electric vehicle chargers. And because we have a great amount of data through our automated metering infrastructure, we're able to provide that to them and model that. And that data is not, uh, no one knows who it is. We don't know meter numbers. Uh, we, they don't know meter numbers. They don't know customers. But we can take a look at that and see what the impact's going to be through a lot of modeling, which is going to be really important for us and other utilities moving forward. So I see additional needs, and I think we'll have discussions as you look at additional parking lots to see if there's a need. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd rather see retail and kind of stay out of the private sector of electric vehicle charging, uh, but we also need to make sure we have those available in our building seem like a great opportunity. We were also fortunate enough to get a grant to help pay for some of that cost. The Volkswagen Mitigation Settlement Grant through the Department of Transportation in Iowa gave us some funds that helps pay for a portion of the cost of that charger. John, this the infrastructure that we have installed now is for level two. Uh, a, a chance of increasing to level three chargers? Is the infrastructure that we have capable of doing that? Is it any different? Would we ever go to a level three or maybe we don't know that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We looked at the level three today. The price point for a level three is significantly higher. Uh, and we just felt it couldn't be justified today given the fact that there's not enough vehicles out there. But it could be in time. We've looked at other areas that might be a little easier to do that, Central Park is one example of a place where we might be able to put a, a level three. Uh, in the case of a level three, we may have to increase the size of a transformer and also increase the voltage potentially out of that transformer. So, so we have a lot of things that we'd have to look through at the level three, but we have the ability to do it. Okay. There is one level three charger right now in Aldona, and that's at Chemnitz, at their Ford dealership. They have one set up there, it's a 50 kW level three charger and that's active and available for people with electric vehicles. We got any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, with that information, I guess I'd move that we waive the second reading. Second. We have a motion from Harley, a second from Don to waive the second reading. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler. Yes. Don. Yes. Harley. Yes. Brad. Yes. Rodney. Yes. Motion carried. <coughs> Move to approve the second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the second reading. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler. Yes. Don. Yes. Harley. Yes. Brad. Yes. Rodney. Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 12 is a resolution pertaining to a service agreement with the care team. Uh, so this is a similar resolution to what we had last week um, with um, other nonprofits. Uh, this resolution approves a uh, service agreement with uh, the care team. Uh, the agreement automatically renews annually um, unless either party uh, gives notice to terminate the agreement and then that's also subject to um, an amount to be allocated uh, by the city council annually um, for those services. Uh, the funding to nonprofit organizations has been the emphasis that the state auditor um, has uh, been a focus on the last couple of years. And so this is just kind of getting those formal um, agreements in place um, in terms of uh, what the funding is and what the expectation is back uh, for that financial support. Uh, for this year in the FY23 budget, there is $5,500 um, line item uh, to go to the care team. So uh, this resolution approves the contract and then $5,500 for this fiscal year. And then um, um, future amounts will be determined at the annual budgeting process. Motion to approve resolution for the care team. Second. A motion from Rodney, a second from Tyler. Any discussion? <coughs> Roll call, Deb. Tyler. Yes. Don. Yes. Harley. Yes. Brad. Yes. Rodney. Yes. Motion carries. Agenda item number 13. This is a resolution pertaining to a service agreement with Access Systems. 
Believe it or not, we are coming up on five years in being here in City Hall, and um, as well as our IT equipment. Um, so Access Systems is the city's um, IT provider. Uh, we switched to them in 2019, uh, 2018, um, I should say. So when we built City Hall, um, they designed and did the initial install. Um, we currently lease um, our server equipment from them. Uh, the current rate is uh, approximately $850 a month, and then that includes um, a backup server, a um, uh, cloud backup, as well as any ongoing service, firewall, 24-7 monitoring, um, really an all-inclusive with that um, amount. Um, our current server is coming up um, on five years here, and the warranty is going to be about out of date. Um, to extend that warranty is going to be over a little more than $1,000 to get us through the end of um, when that server would otherwise be up uh, late next summer. Uh, and talking uh, kind of with access systems and what we're looking at in terms of having to pay for that um, warranty extension, which um, we'd want just in case something did go, go wrong, um, we could get another server here quick and we could continue operations if, without that. Our information would all still be there, but our ability to operate off of it, there would be a lead time to get something new set up. Uh, and so kind of factoring that as well as where they're coming at with seeing kind of costs come up over time. Um, and talking with them, we thought it made sense to renew the server lease agreement earlier. Uh, because if we factor in what the per month cost will be come November uh, on the pricing, plus what the server would be over the five-year life of the, the server, it would, it would cost more to do it the other way. Um, so we're not, we're not, you know, there's no capital equipment that we own that we're cutting short the life on. Everything's leased. And so this would simply just change um, the lease agreement. Um, they would come in, reinstall um, all the new equipment. Uh, that increase would go up. Uh, they, the new lease agreement would be $1,159 per month. Um, all the services that we currently have, and then with that, um, it comes with a five-year warranty, um, whereas before on our current server, we were constantly having to purchase one-year extensions because it only came with a, with a one-year. Um, so it'll be a, a new, new physical uh, server hardware as well as new software. Um, firewall, it'll be, um, I don't understand all the technicalities, but a solid state drive instead of a spinning drive, which is a much more efficient system. Um, so kind of just based on the advice we got from them and just looking at the cost of what we're going to see in increases and that um, make, um, getting that lease agreement, uh, we thought it made sense to go ahead and renew that uh, new lease agreement here a little bit early. Um, if this is approved tonight, um, it will be about 45 day lead time uh, for them to uh, get the new system set up. Second. We have a motion from Tyler, second from Rodney. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 14 concerns the airport runway project. Um, when the airport uh, decided to hire Bolton and Mink and uh, in replacement for CGA, we signed work order number one for the runway project. Uh, as we've been working through engineering with the FAA, we agreed to addendum number one, which was a larger turnaround on the northwest end of the runway. Now we've got the 90% report into the FAA. With that larger turnaround, there is some water swampy area that's gonna be just off to the side of that turnaround. So the FAA would like us to have engineering for a stormwater uh, piping of such uh, to go out to the ditch to get that water away from the turnaround. So addendum number three is adding the value and hiring Bolton Mink to do that additional engineering that the FAA is requesting. It is, it's, the FAA will refund us 90%. We have to pay 10% of the engineering. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion from Harley, second from Don. Any discussion? 
Uh, one question that I've got, Barb, is this amount, um, this is a solid, this is what? This is what, what we're what, agreeing to, it cannot exceed that. that okay, yeah, okay. Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 15 pertains to the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, this was um, back in September. We um, awarded the contract for the secondary wet well project to uh, TJ's trekking and excavating of Winona, Minnesota. Uh, that award was contingent upon a revised scope of work uh, being negotiated um, based on the price to reduce that. Um, and so we've gone through that process and now have a, a recommended uh, revision to that scope of work. Uh, Kevin Graves from WHKS Engineering is here. He can provide a, an overview of uh, the proposed changes and how uh, the rationale has come to. Thank you, Jake. Uh, as Jake mentioned, Kevin Graves, WHKS Engineers. And um, since that meeting in September, when we talked about the, the secondary wet well project and uh, where we currently stood with uh, the scope and the cost, We've had uh, discussions with the with the contractor, TJ's Trucking. Uh, we had an on-site visit where WHKS, uh, TJ's Trucking, and then also the wastewater operations staff, Mark, and the guys down the plant. We all had a, a, an on-site powwow, talked through what the this revised scope would look like, uh, come up coming up with the, the best plan possible to reduce the cost of the project to kind of fit within the, the budgetary parameters that the city has, uh, but also make sure we're looking at the, the long-term uh, progress of the facility, that the, the things that we're going to do aren't just kind of band-aids for the, the project, that what we can include in this project will uh, will integrate well into the, the larger treatment plant improvements project that's going to be happening in a few years. So we did that. Um, we, we looked at both kind of inside the, the secondary wet well basement where the, the piping modifications are to be done, identified which ones are, are critical now, which ones can be delayed and or would be better off being delayed in the future once the, the new pumps come in with the larger project. And then the upper slab, the concrete slab, where we had the, the, you know, the weathering effect has been happening that we wanted to do something about. Um, talked about what that is going to, uh, what that's going to look like in the future, what made the most sense to, to try to remove the water from that area to help extend the life for a few more years of that slab. So what was <coughs> determined for the scope revisions uh, were for drainage improvements, both internal and external. So those, uh, and I won't go into too terribly great detail here for you tonight, but uh, in general, the, the internal drainage improvements were going to be um, poking a couple holes, drilling three holes in that upper slab down in through the basement structure, um, which would, uh, and, and then connecting up piping inside to pull that water from the upper slab down into the basement, it's a little counterintuitive, but we wanted to be able to control pulling that water in and bringing it to a sump, sump pit that currently exists in that basement. And then we could take that sump and then pump it back out. Would allow us to remove that water that's been sitting on that up, uh, in between the upper slab and the ceiling, uh, and that's freezing and thawing and having that weathering effect create a larger issue. So that's, that was our internal drainage improvements. Um, the second one would be external drainage. And what we're doing there is to add in um, drain tile around the perimeter of that secondary wet well. Um, it's very flat in that area. There, the, the concrete structures don't allow the water to, to move away very quickly from when we have surface water with rain events or snow melt. So installing those, the drain tile and re Regrading that area allows us to get that surface water to uh, to pull away from that upper slab. So not only are we anything that does pond up on that upper slab, we're pulling away and, and pumping, but then we're trying to prevent as much water as we can from sitting there and freezing up. So those were the uh, the items that we did include. We also factored in um, what that 
what our new project is going to look like for piping. So we actually added some, um, some piping to the project. It, the original project had about eight feet of 24-inch uh, influent piping that's going to be coming into the wet well, which will be your new influent line when the, the full large project comes to into, into effect. With the drain tile and what we're proposing for that area in the future, it made sense to try to install about 40 feet of that pipe now. That will allow us to, to because that, that pipe is uh, very low on the ground, deep install means if we were to not do that now, then we would have to come back and rip up most of that drain tile work that we would be putting in currently. So we did extend out that 24-inch uh, pipe uh, from 8 to 40 feet. The rest of, uh, and that will allow us to make sure that the future, or the current work, will be able to be utilized in the future as well. So what that, uh, what that did for us from a cost perspective, the original bid that came in was uh, roughly 263000 and some change from the contractor. Um, the, the scope changes that we made uh, allowed us to, to drop that number to, I believe it's $179,035. We did also do some changes in terms of what pumps got replaced or deferred as well on the discharge pumps. So the, uh, the, the, the discharge pumps were, were not planned for this project, um, but the, the piping that was inside of the building, the, the original project scope had us replacing all the piping and valves on both the suction side of the pumps and the discharge side of the pumps. What we identified when we walked through the, the plant is uh, it's going to make sense for us to do the suction side of the pumps now. That's kind of the, the critical piece that needs to get done uh, sooner rather than later so that Mark can change out pumps if needed without having to completely drain that entire system down uh, and, and causing a, a very significant maintenance headache. On the discharge side, uh, if we were to replace those, those piping and valves now, we would effectively need to pull pumps out change out the pumps, or the valves, and then put the pumps back in place. I mean, there was, it's probably, it was like fifteen to $20,000 of additional labor that was going to be added into this project that can be um, preferably saved, if, if, if not deferred, saved until the future when we're going to be yanking out those pumps anyways and replacing the, those valves and piping. Anybody else have any questions or? And when does this work look to begin if we approve? So the the completion date that we have on the project, I believe, is I think it's August of, of next year. The the main reason that we extended it out that far was to make sure that the contractor had enough time to order his materials. The the valves are the likely the longest item uh, to happen, so those valves will probably be ordered uh, over the winter, and that work would likely done in the spring. Now the, the, the drainage improvements, those things that we're adding, the drain tile um, and that, that work on top of the upper slab, we are, we're going to be uh, encouraging the contractor to get that done as soon as possible. So we think that there's going to be some work happening out there yet this fall and then the, there'll be a, kind of a, a pause over the winter months and then once the valves are uh, come in and the, the weather conditions are acceptable then likely in the spring is when we're going to see the, the bulk of the work be done. So kind of for the sake of documenting the change, even though the previous resolution authorized the mayor um, to do it, um, we just have a resolution re approving the revised scope of work and the contract price for that $179.35 to be considered. Appreciate all the work going back and looking at that. So I make a motion to approve the resolution amending the contract or construction contract. Second. So a motion from Rodney, second from Brad. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. 
Agenda item number 16 is in regards to the EMS full-time staff schedule and time card policy. Yes, I, I apologize. I should have uh, had this um, earlier on as a agenda amendment. Um, we don't have a, a final version of that yet. As you can imagine, Phil's been pretty busy this month um, with community meetings as, we, as he works on uh, the public information for the uh, essential service. Um, but I did want to just kind of provide an update on what we're proposing. We did meet with the uh, current EMS staff um, and share this plan with them. Um, so the current way the schedule works is it is a three on, three off. And so the first day, um, it's uh, 16 hours um, is the regular shift and there's eight hours of downtime um, that's paid at a reduced rate and that's from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, second day it's a uh, on or you're on on call day and that's just paid at five dollars an hour um, and then the third day is another full on day like the first day so it's three on three off um, what we've found in terms of trying to hire as well as you know maintain employees as well as just help you know with them with their work-life balance is that uh, second backup day is it, it's just not anything that's attractive and, and as we've seen um, other services, it used to be pretty commonplace to have that, um, and, and I think it was mainly geared towards when most of these services were really volunteer-based and led, um, but, you know, as you actually look towards your full-time staff, um, essentially no one is, is having that backup day the way we, we currently are. Um, and so with talking with Phil and the staff, what we've proposed is uh, having a two-week cycle um, that first week they would do uh, three days on, still that 16 um, uh, hours of then eight downtime, and that second uh, week there'd be two days on of that 16 and eight. Uh, so that first week there would be guaranteed overtime, um, just of the, the way EMS they have to follow a 40 week, even though like fire and PD, PD doesn't. Uh, but then that second week, you know, they'd only, uh, you'd be scheduled for those 32 hours, so that overtime they earned in the first week, they could use that as comp time to, you know, get to 40 on the second, um, or if there's any callback time or additional shifts that they pick up, um, that could out of that 40, or as long as they're working that 32, you know, they can just, you know, get paid for that 32. Um, so we th uh, in talking with staff and Phil, we think this would be a much better, or much more attractive um, for recruiting employees and, and retaining our employees and kind of give, you know, getting, get, getting away from that um, backup on call day, um, which is extremely unpopular. So that's the, the plan moving forward to get to that. We need to add a couple more staff folks. So we uh, had a couple interviews today and we have some more scheduled for some EMTs. Um, so we'll um, kind of have this transition of the current schedule and then once we get a couple more people on board, we'll be able to make that switch. Uh, but there will, there probably will be a, a brief time there where the uh, any new hires would be following this proposed new schedule, um, while you know the, the current employees would still be doing that backup. Um, but again, as soon as we, I think it's you know two or three. Once we get them hired, then we can make that switch for everyone. Um, so that's the the plan moving forward. Um, happy to answer any questions on that. But we'll should have that um, agreement for, or excuse me, that amendment for approval at the next council meeting. Anybody have any questions? Should we table, table this? That? Yeah. Okay. Motion to table. Do we need that? Yeah, we need to table the number of the resolution. I'll second. We have a motion from uh, Rodney, second from Tyler to table this. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Carly? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. This then will be tabled. Agenda item number 17 pertains to 16 or 615 East North Street. Uh, this is a resolution accepting a bid for one of our CDBG owner occupied housing rehab grants. Uh, it is for the amount of $53,662. If you recall, we cannot do a project over $24,999. Hence, the two change orders that are coming after we approve the contract. Uh, that 53,662 is broken down into $43,044 of actual work on the home and $10,618 in lead hazard re 
reduction. The 24999 does not include lead hazard reduction. So if you want, I can go ahead with the change orders and explain it all at once, or do you want to just vote on the resolution first? Might as well do the change orders. Okay. Then there's two change orders. Uh, change order number one is for $20,421, and change order number two is for $3,000. That brings the actual cost of the rehabilitation of the home down to $22,303, and the lead hazard rehabilitation down to $8,208. So we will be compliant with the CDBG regulations once we approve the two change orders. There is just a lot of lead windows that needed to be repaired, old historic windows, and um, it's the house up there on our street that's got some historic look to it, and it, for what CDBG is funding, you cannot replace all those windows and keep it historic the way it has to be. So a lot of the windows came off, but they can still do some repairs to the home. So we still need to break this into two, though, and approve the resolution yeah. and the change orders. So. Motion to approve resolution 4615 North Street. Second. A motion for Ronnie, second from Don. Any discussion? Vote, please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Carly? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Motion, motion to approve the change orders. Motion from Brad, is there a second? I'll second. Second from Tyler, any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. <coughs> Agenda item number 19 is to approve a pay application for the library <coughs> renovation project. Uh, this is pay application number 15 from Hinkle Construction um, in the amount of $30,331.36. Uh, this is for work completed in September on the exterior renovation project. Um, with that project, the uh, concrete forms and kind of parking barriers, those are now installed. Um, the steel uh, for the overhang and the beams, that is arriving uh, this week, mm -hmm. and then we'll get moving on that. So hopefully we'll have it wrapped up um, by the end of this calendar year or early into 2023. So the, some of the concerns we had on materials for lead times ended up not happening, which usually isn't the case. <laughs> Move to approve the pay application. Second. We have a motion from Don, second from Brad to approve this pay application. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried, thank you. Agenda item number 20 pertains to a pay application. Uh, Matt Cole with uh, uh, <coughs> Bolton and Mank is here. Um, so I'll invite him up now and he can uh, provide kind of a quick overview on the pay applications as well as uh, where we're at in terms of progress and, and next steps. Thank you, Jacob. Um, we'll just jump right into McCoy's Hill Street. Uh, McCoy Street is currently open. signs are installed and they started on striping last week. Um, they're grinding in all those stalls out there on the new concrete. Um, so there's a little bit of more of a process to paint the stripes. And then last week it was a little chilly to be uh, striping anyway. So um, they will be back later this week to finish McCoy Street and start on the Overlay Project striping. They're the same contractor doing both, both jabs. Um, Phillips Street has moved along nicely. All the underground is done. Uh, all the rock base is placed. Wix is back in town setting string and getting ready for mainline paving uh, this Thursday and Friday on the whole length of Phillips Street. Uh, then we'll jump back and do tie-ins next week and get the intersections put back and start with driveways and sidewalks. After that, so you know, probably about a three-week process to get the concrete done on Phillips Street with the gas relocation delays. You know, we're looking into the early part of November to get everything wrapped up out there, but moving along the best they can for uh, the 
seen out there along with the sidewalk pavers for the bump out decoration to kind of match Dodge Street and looking to get that project wrapped up and hopefully open before the 31st. Uh, once the pavers are in, it just needs to be striped and, and the signs reinstalled for A and B parking for the winter winter parking and, and the Fall Street parking lot signage. Uh, jumping on to the overlay project, uh, got a lot of work done on that project last week with paving of Nebraska Street, Jones, and Harlan, uh, along with all the concrete work along Pine Street and Jones Street, uh, the north block of Jones Street by the car wash. Uh, the plan to come back to town to, to pave part of the car wash alley, kind of keeping it half open for the access to the business there. Um, hopefully this week if the weather allows. Um, and then just have the paving on that one block of Jones Street and Pine Street remaining, uh, which is scheduled to take place either late this week or early next week for that job. Um, pickleball court, Jake kind of mentioned that it is now open, finally. Um, open Saturday, and got the open house coming up this Friday. So um, that's kind of the three project summaries that I got. Anybody have any questions on any of the projects? Matt, who sets the pavers? On the parking lot. Uh, Minor Hardscape, uh, I believe it's the same contractor that did Dodge Street. So okay. uh, that's who uh, Reddings have hired as their subcontractor to do all their pervious paver and then the sidewalk paver, which are just regular brick pavers. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I would just like to take the opportunity um, with the um, projects last year as well as this year um, to express the thanks and gratitude to the Bolton Mink team, but especially Matt. Um, <laughs> he's been all around town this year, and um, I'm, ama I'm amazed at all the technical details he can keep in his head on any random project at any time when we call him and, and hey, can we come to this and this, and what are we doing and why, you know, and uh, working with homeowners, working with businesses, um, you know, just detours, things like that. Um, he's, uh, he's been all around town, <laughs> um, and, and so I uh, just want to uh, thank him for, for his work on that, and uh, he does a real good job of uh, working with owners and being able to um, communicate those technical aspects and construction things, which aren't always uh, something that is, is done well, but breaking those down and communicating them well to the public, so yeah. just wanted to show our appreciation. Yeah. yeah, thank you, man. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Move to approve the payout. Second. Um, motion from Don, second from Rodney to approve the pay application on agenda item number 20. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Pay application on number 21. Um, this is pay application number three from Blacktop Services for the mill and overlay project. Um, this uh, uh, request is for $602,086.30. Motion to approve. Second. Motion from Rodney, second from Don to approve this pay application. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Carly? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. And agenda item number 22, this is the pay application pertaining to the pickleball courts. Uh, this pay application is submitted by uh, Erpeline's Excavating Enterprises. Um, the pay application request is for $74,983.01. Um, the project is currently still not complete. There's a couple just site improvements, including the handrails that still need to be completed. Um, per the contract, um, Timeline, August 1st was substantial completion, and then September 1st was the date that all work was to be completed and ready for final payment. Um, and then with that, um, there are terms in the uh, contract for the city to charge for liquidated damages for any time over that. Um, those aren't designed to be punitive, but really to recover the additional costs that you know, was incurred if we're having to have additional construction management or administration from Boltland Bank, um, you know, our additional staff time, things like that of, of when, a, you know, a project should have been wrapped up. Um, so um, 
at this time, the recommendation for this pay app is, um, is just to approve payment of $64,775.07. Um, basically what we're doing is the uh, doubling what we're holding in retainage um, from the $10,207.94 that um, has been um, earned in retainage uh, to date uh, based on that 5%, but just holding that 10% um, since the project is still outstanding um, until it's, it's done and then we can have the conversation on what factors, what the you know additional costs were and we can have those calculations and figure out if and what amount should be considered for liquidated damages. Um, so that's the, the recommendation just to make that uh, partial payment withholding that additional 5% retainage. Move to approve the application with the additional retainage being held. Second. A motion from Harley, second from Don. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Uh, yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 23 is also a pay application. This is for the skate park project. Yes. Um, this is for 25% of the cost of the project in the amount of $64,762.50. Uh, per the contract, uh, this amount was due upon mobilization. Um, so as you, if you drove by there today or, or over Friday, you saw they've got a, a big hole dug. Um, so they're going to be uh, this week working on uh, getting the new base in there. We excavated out an additional two feet. Uh, to get a nice uh, base in there for the freeze-thaw cycles. Um, and then the, um, all the steel will be arriving uh, this week as well. Um, so that's the steel coping and kind of the, I guess the skeleton of the structure is, is pre-built then shipped in, assembled, and then that's what's used to, uh, as the forms to, to place all the concrete. Uh, so just kind of, you know, this project should be done by mid-November, um, so if we held this pay up, you know, till you know, we don't meet again till November 7th, uh, so we have, you know, approval at this meeting, uh, but we do plan, we're going to just hold that check until middle of next week just to make sure things are are going as they should um, and that those things arrive on site. Not that there's there's concern about that, but just kind of from a formality process. Um, so that would be the, this pay up for about 64000 um, $762. Motion to approve pay application. Second. Motion from Rodney, second from Tyler to approve this pay application. Any discussion? Vote please, Deb. Tyler? Yes. Don? Yes. Harley? Yes. Brad? Yes. Rodney? Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 24 um, is an appointment to the Parks and Recreation Commission to fill Zoe Dow's term, which expires December 31st, 2025. Uh, anyone have a name to fill that position yet? Jody mentioned okay. somebody, but she's not here tonight, so I don't know. And I think uh, I think she, the person that she asked wasn't be, going to be able to fill that. So I didn't know if anybody heard anything. I no. Okay, so we need to keep her ears open okay. for that position then. And uh, agenda item number 25, this is the first notification of vacancy at, with a cemetery board trustee. Jenny Weaver um, has resigned from the cemetery board and her term expires the third, um, August the 11th, 2024. So that's just the first notification of that vacancy. And agenda item number 26, our final agenda item, this is the first notification for the airport commission, um, Frank Vissom's term expires November the 27th of this year, and that's a six year term. So, but this is just the first notification of that um, a notice. So this brings us to the end of our published agenda. It's uh, six o'clock, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're adjourned. Thank you.